again, everyone. You're watching the 2022 Emerging Trends Edition of Industry Insights Webinars. I'm Tiffany Nielsen, and with me today is Jeff Winter, who is an industry executive in manufacturing for Microsoft. How are you doing today, Jeff? I'm doing great. How are you? Excellent. And can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Sure. So I started my career off as a sales engineer, but I never really wanted to be a practicing engineer. I liked working with engineers though. So being in a role where I could go from company to company and learn how stuff was made um, and solve problems using cool new technology seemed right up my alley. Now over time that kind of blossomed into me figuring out that I had a knack for marketing and strategy, but my style of developing value propositions and determining product offerings and strategic direction was based on me being a thought leader in the industry. So that was just the way that I was an effective seller and marketer. I had to know my subjects in and out. So for years, I sort of merged the two together and I focused on being a thought leader, someone who was well-informed on a specific subject. And in my case right now, industry 4.0, and then use that to help me be a better marketer and seller. Ultimately, my success uh, led to me landing a job at Microsoft, where now I'm excited to take what I was doing previously to a whole new level. Thank you, Jeff. And speaking of Industry 4.0, where do you see our society in the timeline expected for digital transformation and Industry 4.0? So that is a tough question to answer. And the main reason is because there is no good answer for what exactly industry 4.0 and digital transformation mean. I mean, the idea and vision of industry 4.0 originated from Hanover Fair in 2011, and that turned into the high tech strategy of the German government. And then this idea kind of took hold everywhere around the world, but every country sort of made their own version of it and all similar, but not exactly the same. So to put in perspective, two of the largest standards bodies in the world, ISO and IEC, they got together and formed a group called Joint Working Group 21. It happens to be one that I'm a part of. And the main purpose of that is getting consensus on a definition for Industry 4.0. Interestingly enough, they actually chose the word smart manufacturing because they thought it would be more accepted worldwide, even though most people just Google Industry 4.0 but it was meant to encapsulate the same sentiment as what was presented by the German government, but include a few additional principles. So that group was working for years, developing lots of technical reports. In fact, there were six to 10 definitions that were floating around until the middle of 2021, until they finally agreed and developed a standard. An official worldwide consensus was just made a few months ago. So a decade after Industry 4.0 was introduced, the world finally defined it, just as smart manufacturing. But it's still crazy. So going forward, this definition will be used in dozens and dozens of ISO and IEC standards that reference the concept of smart manufacturing. Now, digital transformation, on the other hand, is an even more undefined term with no real direct ownership um, or origin of the word. And it's probably because most people generally describe it more as a journey or a strategy and not a, a vision or a destination. So that means there's no standard bodies trying to define it. Now, the whole reason I brought all that up is because these buzzwords have been very difficult to pin down. So the only real way to answer your question I know is based off two things, surveys and market size. So for surveys, that's basically just asking people if they're adopting industry 4.0 technologies or if they're meeting their digital transformation goals. That's it. And according to IoT analytics in 2020, less than 30% of manufacturers reported extensive adoption of industry 4.0 technologies. But that adoption level is different uh, in different regions around the world and even different by industry. So for example, that report said that uh, North America had the greatest adoption of industry 4.0 technologies with automotive leading the pack. And they did this just by asking on 17 different technologies and um, aggregating the results up. But because there was no standardized definition, different studies ask slightly different questions and get different results. But one thing that's consistent across all studies is that most companies and even most countries are not close to industry 4.0. Now, if you look at the other side, market size is another indicator. Uh, most market research reports kind of peg industry 4.0, the market anywhere between 100 to $300 billion today, depending on what you include. But 
all of them expect to reach huge numbers like 1 trillion plus by 2030 or 2031. So it's less than 10 years away. So I would actually just say that we're getting started as a society on our digital transformation journey. Wow, Jeff, well, it's happening really fast. <laughs> from from an as an onlooker, it is definitely happening very, very fast. And so, one of the posts that you shared on LinkedIn highlighted that PPT development, which is people, processes, and technology, dated back all the way to the 1960s. Can you tell us more about that and a little about what maybe changed or didn't change about their original vision? Sure. I uh, I actually just recently stumbled across the PPT framework, people, process, and technology, and made it a post on LinkedIn uh, and how it was uh, related to digital transformation, which ended up actually getting picked up into a short article. And I was probably just as surprised as you to find out that it had its origins from the 1960s. It came from, um, from Harold Levitt's diamond model, but then got uh, refined over time and popularized by Bruce Shiner in the late 1990s. So this PPT framework is all about the three elements and how they interact. The people do the work, the processes make the work more efficient, and the technology helps people do their tasks and helps automate the processes. So this framework is originally intended for IT management, specifically security and business intelligence, but it got applied to all sorts of things. But now that digital transformation is on everyone's radar and makes it all the way up to the CEO, I believe this framework is actually more useful, more relevant, and even more necessary than ever. The only thing I would say that's probably changed is the scope. Before it was related to typically a smaller part of the organization, IT, and now it's the whole organization. But unfortunately, as much as people generally understand that there needs to be a balance between the three elements, they often ignore the people part in practice. Aha. Uh -huh. And so I know that you have a particular interest in IoT data, as do I. And so you have some information and data that you are going to share with us about how this data is being collected and how much data there is. Let's take a look at that video. for how this data is being used and how do you measure the ROI? So this video shows you the unfathomable amount of data that's just being generated, which is just truly mind boggling. But what this video doesn't show you is that a majority of the data is either completely unknown or unused, which is actually commonly referred to as dark data, which according to Splunk comprises 55% of all data collected by companies. And this is usually caused by not having the tools to capture or unlock the data or too much data and not enough analytics or an ability to access only structured data while most data is unstructured and just missing or incomplete data. What's also true is very commonly it's, it's data that's left behind from processes that get scattered across every level of the business. And so it's disregarded uh, and considered unnecessary by one department, but maybe highly valuable to another. So right there is one thing to try and consider when it comes to ROI of data. How much are you actually using versus paying to collect and paying to store and then doing nothing with it? So now that being said, there are lots of industries and companies taking advantage of at least a portion of the data that they're collecting. According to IDC, telecommunications has an 87% big data usage rate, followed by financial services and healthcare. But how industries like telecommunications are using big data is entirely different than industries like manufacturing and how they're using it. So for example, uh, telecom, it's uh, customer acquisition, network optimization, and customer retention are the top three use cases. But for manufacturing, which is on the less mature side, the top use cases are predictive maintenance and predictive quality, uh, anomaly detection, production forecasting, and improving throughput and yield. 
But what I actually find most interesting though, is while telecommunications is the industry that is using the most data, manufacturing is actually the industry that generates the most data. So they actually should have a head start. But how you measure ROI, that will drastically change based off the problem that you're trying to solve and which tool you're using to solve it. There are tons of variables at play. And generally speaking, though, you need to you need to first assess the cost of big data engagement against the accuracy and relevancy of the insight and then gauge how that insight actually transforms decision making into money. Because the last thing you want to do is pay to collect and store dark data, which is unknown or unused or even worse, bad data. Very interesting. And another trend that I've been following is the new meaning of SMART. And Jeff, you are on so many different standards committees and boards. Can you tell us from your perspective what you feel is the new meaning of SMART or is it the same? Has anything changed about the term or the way that we approach the concept of SMART? Sure. So the, wor the word SMART is another buzzword. I mean, there are smart thermostats, smart doorbells, smart water bottles, smart shoes, and even smart toilets. In fact, if there is a device out there, electronic or not, chances are, I almost guarantee there is a smart version of that same product. Less guaranteed though, is that the word smart actually means anything. So smart is a very vague yet sophisticated sounding adjective that can be added to anything to make it appear more capable and more appealing and most important, more expensive. But in reality, these devices aren't actually smart. I mean, they don't think, they can't reason or learn or solve complex problems the way that we describe a smart person. Now, as far as I know, the term became popular as a way to describe a device that could, uh, that could connect to the internet. So basically turning a cell phone into a smartphone. With the internet of things, everything became smart. So has the term changed in my opinion? Not really. Marketers will be able to use it in any way they see fit for competitive advantage. But I do think the way that most people use it, the term connected device would actually be more appropriate. At least then people know what we're talking about. Thank you for that, Jeff. And so looking at the digital divide, which is a topic that we cover a lot in our series, is there a digital divide in manufacturing? And for those manufacturers not using these technologies, how much of a disadvantage do you feel they're at? So simply put, yes, there has been a digital divide growing before the pandemic, but as companies are starting to recover from the pandemic, you can really start to see the difference between those digitally enabled and able to quickly adapt and those not digitally enabled and struggling to adapt. Manufacturing, just like any industry is constantly evolving with new ideas, new technologies, and new processes. However, what makes this set of advancements so different than previous advancements is one word, data. Massive amounts of data that fuel all sorts of other new technologies like AI and ML to not only improve efficiency and reduce waste, but also produce levels of insights that we only dreamed of 10 years ago. However, this data requires entirely new roles, which according to World Economic Forum, the three fastest and most demanded jobs are data scientists and data analysts, AI and ML specialists, and big data specialists, all of them working heavily with data. So not only is this divide impacting the manufacturing companies themselves, those that are digitally enabled and are able to take advantage, and those that aren't it's also impacting the labor force, those that are digitally savvy and those that are not. So this is why you see so much investment right now in digital transformation for manufacturers and digital skills for the employees, for the people. And to answer your other question, um, I believe it's Deloitte who reports that early adopters of smart factory initiatives, they've enjoyed average gains of like 10 to 12% in manufacturing output, factory utilization, and even labor productivity. And there's been some other information published by Harvard Business Review that found that digital leaders are one and a half times more likely to optimize production runs based off demand forecasts. So yeah, absolutely, they're gonna take ahead of their competition. And Jeff, can you share a tip with us on how to make digital transformation successful? So this is another tough question because there is no easy answer. I mean, there's no single tip or trick. Digital transformation 
is hard. And I'm sure you've heard the statistics, but most digital transformation initiatives fail. And those companies have a lot of smart people working on it. So just like there's no single answer to success, there's also no single answer to failure. I mean, there's a lot of things that have to come together to make this work. And it's easy to attribute a failure entirely to one thing when it's usually not the case. From everything I've researched, the two biggest themes that seem to differentiate uh, those that experience success and those that experience failure are around clear goals and culture. So most of the time, the, there are clear goals established at a company level, and they're often very good goals, but something happens between the corporate goals and all the technology implementation pilots. And each pilot often needs to justify its own existence to prove its worth, which means new KPIs get set for that pilot to evaluate success, but then often lose sight of those corporate goals. So the more the company uh, goals kind of get parsed out as standalone experiments, each needing to self-justify its own existence, the less focus you are on the overall transformation that you're actually aiming to achieve you end up focusing myopically on that one project. Now for continuous improvement initiatives, that's perfectly okay. But for digital transformation, you really need every initiative, every project, every task clearly linked to the business objective. So everyone knows what they're trying to achieve and their part in it. And for the culture side, this is a hard one too, because there's entire careers dedicated to this, but the big thing you need to know is culture doesn't change easily. So make sure that your digital transformation initiative takes this into consideration and you are tackling too much change at once. Because if digital transformation is successful, basically everyone's job changes. Think about that. Are people ready for that kind of change? I mean, this change and the resistance to change can't just be considered as part of a strategy. It has to be a central part of the digital transformation strategy. Thank you, Jeff. That's great advice. And what is one of your predictions for emerging trends in 2022? The use and proliferation of artificial intelligence and machine learning. In my opinion, that will be the biggest trend of 2022. So what makes AI so interesting, especially compared to most other technologies out there, is how ubiquitous it is in its application. I mean, it impacts nearly every industry, nearly every department, and every job function from the shop floor all the way up to the CEO. Most times, though, when we think of AI or ML, we think about intentionally using it, buying a product that utilizes AI to solve a problem. What we don't think about is the invisible AI that's running under the hood of products or services that we're using. So AI is already starting to be used in most software platforms and IoT devices that you probably don't even know about. This means you may not see one giant big use of AI, but thousands of little uses that all working together can make a very big impact. So like I said, what we're gonna see is the proliferation of AI. So we're going to see AI and ML, it's going to be much more integrated with cybersecurity. So as the Internet of Things is kind of connecting everything together, there's going to be um, much more vulnerabilities. AI embedded online security measures will revamp protection in the virtual world. Sustainability is a hot topic for many companies right now, both large and small. And AI is one of the core technologies at the heart of it, helping to automate processes and streamline operations. And we're also going to see AI used a lot more for machinery maintenance and quality. And both of those two are already the top use cases, but I bet we'll see them even more in 2022. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. And if anyone in the audience has any questions, you can drop those in the chat and we will get to those in the chat or we will respond to them at the end of the webinar. So thank you so much, Jeff. This was amazing. And those were um, incredible insights that you shared with us. So thank you so much. Well, thank you.